Hello, everybody. For the fourth <laughs> this time. This is number four. <laughs> this has been a marvelous day in which both of us have suffered quite aggressively. But this is my co host, Ian Silver of the Orthodox Logos, and I am Nathaniel Harmon of The Road to Paradise. <laughs> and today, we are not going to be watching the She Hulk trailer because we've done. No, you're not going to get to see me watch the She Hulk trailer. Yeah. Thank God, because that was awful. <sighs> I'm kind of kind kind of upset about it. <clears throat> but it's okay. I'll be okay. So, we have a couple of announcements. Yeah. Ian, we'll, would you like to carry us? We'll do this we'll do this real br- real real brief. So, <laughs> in light of the current situations and some of the online ortho drama, I reached back out to our spiritual father to get the 100% specific go ahead and blessing to do the prayer book, which, as I've mentioned before, we do have a blessing to do what we are doing and to, to you know, do a lot of the things that we've done. But it's good sometimes to check in and get specifics on what you can and can't do. And it's good just to stay in touch with your spiritual father as much as possible. So ask your spiritual father before you start things. Don't play the role of someone's spiritual father if, if you're not. And yeah, we have the blessing to do that. And we also have the blessing to do other things. So Nathan, if you want to let people know what those are, please so, do. I am super psyched about this. Um, as many of you know, there are many volumes of the Synexarian available, um, but most of them are geared towards the geographically Eastern saints, um, with the exception of some very early pre-schism, Roman, French, and to some extent British saints. Um, we don't tend to see a lot of focus on them, though. I mean, everybody knows St. Patrick. A few people know St. Bridget of Kildare, but even fewer people know my patron saint, St. David. And even fewer know St. Winifred, right, whom we have talked about before. But our spiritual father has given us the blessing to work on producing a set of synaxaria. If, that, if people might not know what that is, that are... Uh, that, lives of the saints yeah. that, that cover primarily Western saints. And that is not to try to replace... Eastern hagiographies, not by any means. I love the Eastern saints. Um, it's it's a way to it's a way to compliment. But this is a portion of our history that many of us are extremely ignorant of, and that needs to be resolved. So we're going to be working on this project for the next, I would say, probably the next two years. But we're going to be releasing volumes. Hopefully, we'll have the first volume ready to roll in the next two or three months. We'll see how it plays out. But we're going to be focusing on Britain. Um, what we'd classify as late antique or early medieval Gaul in Germany. And we're going to be looking at the Nordic countries. So this is going to be fantastic. And I am extremely excited for this. Um, I've got data that I've been saving, waiting on a blessing and the blessing is here. So keep your eyes peeled um, and keep us in your prayers so that we produce this in such a way that it glorifies God and honors the saints whom it is intended to honor. Yeah. Amen to that. So, yeah, I am super psyched. <laughs> yeah, same. I'm, I think it's going to be going to be great. And um, today's episode, we're going to be talking about Saint, well, Emperor Constantine, Saint Constantine, and his mother, Saint Helen of Blessed Memory. Um, very beautiful hagiography, and we are coming up on the day of commemoration, which is two days m- out, yeah, May twenty first. So we're see- we're seeing that here pretty soon. Um, hopefully the audio is good for this video. We're just starting to get the mixer worked out. So if it's not, uh, my apologies. I mainly spent the money because Nate doesn't know how to speak up. So I I speak loudly sometimes. True. Sometimes not. Sometimes not. But yeah. Um, I heard that. That's because you have headphones in and you can hear everything I'm saying now. That's a weird, unpleasant feeling. So besides um, St. Constantine and St. Helen, we're also going to be focusing on the life of another Western saint, Nathan. I'm not going to try to pronounce the last, <laughs> the last name or the last, the place of origin. St. Vincent of Lorraine. 
So I believe is how you say that. It's a but, very, very short one. I'm not sure if yeah. we can find something more, but um, there's other stuff on him. But the the OCA hagiography works. It's it's still pretty cool. He's 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 got docu. He, he has written works that still survive to this day that are r- worthwhile, specifically relating to the use or the heretical use of scripture, which is pretty interesting. But uh, shall we take it away? Am I reading first, or are you reading first? Um, you can you can start the first few paragraphs if you want. Okay. Here we go, boys, and two or three girls that listen. The church calls there's, Saint... There's a lot more than that now. Four. Sure. The church calls Saint Constantine the equal of the apostles, and historians call him the great. He was the son of Caesar Constantius Chlorus, who governed the lands of Gaul and Britain. His mother was Saint Helen, a Christian of humble birth. At this time, the immense Roman Empire was divided into western and eastern halves, governed by two independent emperors and their co-rulers called Caesars. Constantius Chlorus was Caesar in the western Roman Empire. St. Constantine was born in 274, possibly in Serbia, and in 294, Constantius divorced Helen in order to further his political ambition by marrying a woman of noble rank. After he became emperor, Constantine showed his mother great honor and respect, granting her the imperial title Augusta. Constantine, the future ruler of the whole Roman Empire, was raised to respect Christianity. His father did not persecute Christians in the lands he governed, and this was at the time when when Christians were persecuted throughout the Roman Empire by Diocletian and his co-rulers Maximian Galerius in the east and the emperor Maximian Hercules in the west. After the death of Constantius Chlorus in 306, Constantine was acclaimed by the army at York as emperor. As the emperor of Gaul and Britain, the first act of the new emperor was to grant freedom to practice Christianity in the lands subject to him. The pagan Maximian Galerius in the east and the fierce tyrant Maxentius in the west hated St. Constantine, and they plotted to overthrow and kill him. But St. Constantine bested them in a series of battles, defeating his opponents with the help of God. He prayed to God to give him a sign which would inspire his army to fight valiantly, and the Lord showed him a radiant sign of the cross in the heavens with the inscription, In this sign conquer. After Constantine became the sole ruler of the Western Roman Empire, he issued the Edict of Milan in 313, which guaranteed religious tolerance for Christians. St. Helen, who was a Christian, may have influenced him in this decision. In the year 323, when he became the sole ruler of the entire Roman Empire, he extended the provisions of the Edict of Milan to the eastern half of the empire. After 300 years of persecution, Christians could finally practice their faith without fear. Renouncing paganism, the emperor did not let his capital remain in ancient Rome, the former center of the pagan realm. He transferred his capital to the the east to the city of Byzantium, which was then renamed Constantinople, the city of Constantine, May 11th. Constantine was deeply convinced that only Christianity could unify the immense Roman Empire with its diverse peoples. He supported the church in every way. He recalled Christian confessors from banishment, he built churches, and he showed concern for the clergy. The emperor deeply revered the victory-bearing sign of the cross of the Lord, and he also wanted to find the actual cross upon which our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. For this purpose, he sent his own mother, the Holy Empress Helen, to Jerusalem, granting her both power and money. Patriarch Macarius Macarius of Jerusalem and St. Helen began the search, and through the will of God, the life-creating cross was miraculously discovered in the year 326. And this says, The account of the finding of the cross of the Lord is found under the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, which we celebrate September 14th. Which is actually the feast day for our parish, because we are obviously Holy Cross, Yep, which is fantastic. And we We have a tiny relic of the cross at our parish. Yep. The Orthodox Church commemorates the uncovering of the precious cross and the precious nails by the Holy Empress Helen on March 6. While in Palestine, the Holy Empress did much of benefit for the Church. She ordered that all places connected with the earthly life of the Lord and His all-pure Mother should be freed of all traces of paganism, and she commanded that churches should be built at these places. The Emperor Constantine ordered a magnificent church in honor of Christ's resurrection to be built over his tomb. St. Helen gave the life-creating cross to the patriarch for safekeeping, and took part of the cross with her for the emperor. After distributing generous alms at Jerusalem and feeding the needy, the Holy Empress Helen returned to Constantinople, where she died in the year 327. Because of her great services to the church and her efforts in finding the life-creating cross, the Empress Helen is called the equal of the apostles. 
The peaceful state of the Christian church was disturbed by quarrels and dissensions and heresies which had appeared within the church. Already at the beginning of St. Constantine's reign, the heresies of the Donatists and the Novatians had arisen in the West. They demanded a second baptism for those who had lapsed during the persecutions against Christians. These heresies were repudiated by two local church councils, were finally condemned at the Council of Milan in 316. Particularly ruinous for the church was the rise of the Arian heresy in the East, which denied the divine nature of the Son of God and taught that Jesus Christ was a mere creature. By order of the emperor, the first ecumenical council was convened in the city of Nicaea in 325. And that's where if the you, Nicene Creed comes from. Well, that's you, that's where it is. its origins lie. Yeah. It's actually the nice Constant, Constantinopolitan Nicene Creed or something like that yeah. is actually what we, what we profess. The symbol of our faith. Right. 318 bishops attended this council. Among its participants were confessor bishops from the period of the persecutions and many other luminaries of the church, among whom was St. Nicholas of Myra in Lycia. The emperor was present at the sessions of the council. The heresy of Arius was condemned in the symbol of faith, the creed, composed, in which was included the term consubstantial with the Father, at the insistence of the emperor, confirming the truth of the divinity of Christ, who assumed human nature for the redemption of all the human race. After the Council of Nicaea, St. Constantine continued with his active role in the welfare of the Church. He accepted holy baptism on his deathbed, having prepared for it his entire life. St. Constantine died on the day of Pentecost in the year 337 and was buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles in a crypt he had prepared for himself. Well, um, Blessed yeah. saints pray for us. Um, if anyone wants to know more about the lives of St. Constantine and St. Helen, I highly recommend reading the... Ecclesiastical history from Eusebius of Caesarea. Also read his panegyric in praise of Constantine, which is fantastic. Or it's a funeral oration, but it's it's a really good text to read. Additionally, you can read a text by a church father named Lactantius. I don't actually know if he's a saint or not, but he wrote a book called on the deaths of the persecutors about the persecution that preceded the ascension of the emperor. And it's also a very interesting read. And it tells you a lot about the lives of St. Constantine and St. Helen and what it is that they did for the church. I'm just trying to see if I can find any extra information on St. Vincent. Right. This one might, this one might have a little bit more actually. Yeah. Works for me. So the next um, hagiography we're going to be doing is St. Vincent of Laurent. Laurent. I don't know. <laughs> Nathan. Uh, Nathan's a little better at pronouncing those things. So let me see if I can find this. Nathan, if you want to go ahead and, and start and start reading, I'll, I'll find the image. St. Vincent was born in Toul in Gaul. He was the brother of St. Lupus, Bishop of Troy, who was a companion of St. Germanus of Auxerre. St. Vincent was the was first a soldier, then he left the world to become a monk of the renowned monastery of Laurent, where he was ordained up where he was also ordained a priest. He is known for his combinatorium, which he wrote as an aid to distinguish the true teachings of the church from the confusion of heretics. His most memorable saying is that Christians must follow that faith which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. He wrote the combinatorium about the year 434, three years after the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus which he mentions in the combinatorium and defends, calling the Holy Virgin Theotokos, she who gave birth to God, in opposition to the teachings of Nestorius, which were condemned at the Third Council. Yeah, and that's kind of interesting that we just, right. just touched on that. Right. Without identifying by name Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, St. Vincent condemns his doctrine of grace and predestination, calling it heresy to teach, teach of a certain great and special altogether personal grace of God, which is given to the predestined elect without any labor, without any effort, and without any industry, even though they neither ask, seek, or knock. Um, St. John Cassian also wrote his refutations, and after St. Vincent, after, and with St. Vincent, after the condemnation of Nestorius at the Third Council in 431, and the death of St. Augustine in 430, St. Vincent reposed in peace about the year 445. And then we have a, a hymn um, for of St. Vincent, and it, it it says, I'm not going to sing it to you guys. Sorry about that. You're a chanter. You can do that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not, not going to do that today. With wisdom hast thou made plain to all the Orthodox faith as that which alone hath been believed and honored by all men, always and everywhere. 
also showing heresy to be innovation, groundless and unstable as a gust in a tempest. O Vincent, thine invincible prayers shelter the church of God. I love that. Let's do Vincent pray for us. I really, I really like the uh, part also showing heresy to be an innovation. innovation. Yep, to be made up. Yeah, because we see a lot of innovations happening, especially with uh, all the, you know, denominations. It's like adding things just for the sake of, uh, prog- you know, being progressive well, or to, to fit the spirit of the times. Right, spirit well, of the age. It, it's interesting that he had a bit of a beef, as one might call it, with Saint Augustine. Because yeah. if anyone here does not know, Saint Augustine of Hippo is an Orthodox saint. Yeah. However, he is also a very good example of what it means to not blindly accept every single patristic writing as though it were sacred scripture, because his doctrines of predestination are very problematic. However, his confessions, the city of God, many of his other works are fantastic. And also one of the things that is less well known is St. Augustine wrote a text refuting his, his previous belief in predestination, not terribly men, not terribly long before he reposed. So Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine rather, is still a phenomenal saint. Yeah, I just um, recently uh, picked up the City of God. You're gonna read it. I just sold it. So I take that as a no. Yeah. <laughs> so whoever uh, bought that, you'll enjoy that. I think it was like the first. It was mm-hmm. excerpts from the first edition. Oh, so it wasn't actually a full text. It was just the. Cliff notes. Yeah, you know, a little, a little bit more than that, but yeah, yeah. The city of God is interesting. I've never read it, but I've listened to it. Yeah, and it's interesting. Well, I mean, this one's going to be really short. We spent about this much time um, trying to get the stream going because I kept <laughs> the mixer. I'm just getting used to it. So, right. I mean, we could do the She Hulk if you really want to. I I don't really want to. Okay, we won't. But uh, if if you insist on forcing me to watch it, we can watch. Well, there it was again. there was also another saint we could we could dive into. We could, or we could. What? How shall I say? What What do we have for um <clears throat> for? Let's see the daily saint. Why don't we do today's daily saint? And this is we're on Go Arch right now. Yeah. So this is Patrick of uh, Prusa. Prusa and his companions. Patrick the Higher Martyr and Bishop of Prusa and his companions. So What uh, time frame was this? Okay, so this was well before the before the more popular St. Patrick. Interesting. Yeah, we could do this. You want to read it? Yeah, I'll read it. So today we commemorate, today, May 19th, we commemorate St. Patrick, um, Higher Martyr and Bishop of Prusa and his companion. St. Patrick was a bishop of Prusa, a city in Bithynia, 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 the present day Brusa or Bursa. Because of his Christian faith, he was brought before Julius or Julian, the consul, who in his attempts to persuade Patrick to worship as he himself did, declared that thanks was owed to the gods, lowercase g, for providing the hot springs welling up from the earth for the benefit of man. St. Patrick answered that thanks for this was owed to our Lord Jesus Christ and explained that when he, who is God, created the earth, he made it with both fire and water, and the fire under the earth heats the water which wells up, producing hot springs. He then explained that there is another fire which awaits the ungodly. Because of this, he was cast into the hot springs, but it was the soldiers who cast him in, and not he, who were harmed by the hot water. After this, St. Patrick was beheaded with the presbyters Acacius, Menander, and uh, Polyanus, Polyanus, Polyanus. Most likely, this was during the reign of Diocletian, which was 284 to 305. On the note of Diocletian, this actually brings up something I like to talk about. Um, And this is probably, for anyone who's a student of church history, this will be probably the most controversial thing I ever say um, on, on this show anyway. And that is that of all of the Roman emperors, Diocletian is the one for whom I feel the most pity. Yeah. Because I've read a lot about him and before I was Orthodox, obviously. And what I see is that he actually desired the good of Rome and that he was just very bad at choosing friends and advisors and his co-Augustus, his co-Augustus, because he's the one who implemented this notion of the Tetrarchy. 
his co-Augustus was a man named Galerius, or his Caesar, rather, was Galerius, not his Augustus. His Augustus was um, Maximian, I believe. But he, Galerius was the one who seems to actually kind of manipulate or bully Diocletian into yeah. doing these persecutions. Like you you read even in Eusebius of Caesarea, right? You read the ecclesiastical history and it's like Diocletian is this weak-willed old man who wants to just go farm cabbages and Galerius is bullying him into saying, oh, we should kill Christians. And it's very sad. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about how we need to pray for those who have reposed, especially those Christians who have reposed. But we also should pray for pagans who have too. And I will say, the Emperor Diocletian is one of those reposed who's on my prayer list because I feel, when I read about him, I feel so bad for him. Like, I really do pity him. Galerius is not, interestingly, which speaks to my hard-heartedness. But, yeah. That, um, that might be the most unpopular thing that I say on this show. Really? <laughs> yeah. No, I think we're I think we're called to pray for everybody. Um, also, we could do the reading today, which is... Um, this is for the fourth Sunday after Pascha, the Acts of the Apostles, um, ten, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Uh, the reading is from Acts of the Apostles. In those days, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does not and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ. The word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, he, how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses to all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him manifest not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So that's today's reading, uh, the fourth Thursday after Pasch after Pascha. So, I mean, this is something that I wanted to get back into doing anyway. This is right. kind of how I started my journey on... on uh, youtube with with you guys was kind of reading the right. stuff so i think it's it's a, good, it's a good thing to get back a good habit to get back into uh nathan do you want to read the gospel that's if, if you think that that's a good idea sure yeah so for the fourth thursday after pascha the gospel is according to the gospel reading is according to saint john chapter 8 verses 12 through 20 Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees then said to him, You are bearing witness to yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness to myself, my testimony is true, for I know whence I have come and whither I am going. But you do not know whence I come or whither I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone that judge, but I and he who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I bear witness to myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness to me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father, for if you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Yeah, so that's the reading for uh, for today, May nineteenth, the fourth Thursday after Pascha. I don't know. Do you have any any final thoughts or any? I just kind of wanted to recapitulate a little bit what we talked about yesterday and what we spoke about with Father John Valdez of uh, Death to the World. And because partially because it really weighs on my heart because I am not someone who is inclined to be a gracious or merciful man. It's, I mean, we've been friends for what, a little over a year. And if you're not aware of that by now, then <laughs> you, you soon will be. But when someone rejects the church, rejects Christ, 
when they reject common moral decency. We should not, indeed we cannot, come down on them as though they are actually demons. That is the temptation. That's something that I've done for many years with people because it's easy to do and I'm good at it. And because when we do that, we, as Ian said in one of his recent texts, or one of the recent things he posted on Instagram, I believe it was either you or Isaac, I don't remember, but something, you know, referring back to the the passage in the Gospels where Christ says, yeah, if you want to pull the speck out of your brother's eye, pull the bloody log out of your own eye first. Um, when we begin to cast judgment on people, we are beating them with the log that's sitting in our eye and we don't even know. And an example of that is, you know, I've, I've I interact with people that are not Christian in any sense of the word and never were. Um, and it's interesting to hear how they, even they have a moral sense of women shouldn't act in a particular way or be aggressively promiscuous or being a lazy and, and an alcoholic or lazy and a drug addict or just lazy and slothful is bad. But sitting from an outside perspective, you know, being able to kind of see them a little bit um, in, in a way slightly differently than they perceive themselves, I'm able to see that, well, yeah, you're not wrong in your assessment. These things are bad, but you participate in these things. Yeah. Like, why are you so upset that this happens when you participate in it? And what that, when I'm saying what that does to me is, makes me go, oh, well, wait a minute, I do the same thing. Yeah, our judgment isn't true. Right. Compared to Christ's judgment. Well, because either. I'm not judging myself, right? I'm judging other people like, well, you do that. It's like, well, yeah, they do that. But yeah. what do you do that's the same? Yeah. You know, and that's that's a really hard thing for me to at least apply to my own life, I'll put it that way, because that's... it's extremely difficult to judge yourself because it's... I would say it's kind of like in the, in the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films whenever and, you know this never actually happens in the books but whatever in the films it's a thing when Frodo, well, there's a lot that doesn't happen in the films that happen in the books too so right there's a lot of lessons to be taken from both right but when Frodo has the ring on he usually ends up seeing the eye of Sauron yeah. right and it's like this bit where he puts it on and sees it and is having to stare at it and the horror of seeing what it is almost drives him insane every time he does it like he completely loses control of himself and falls and trips over stuff or just stupid things. That's like having, uh, right. being tempted by your passions. Well, that's what looking at yourself is like. And it's not that looking at yourself is evil, but looking at yourself produces the same reaction, the same revulsion in what you are, what you do. And it's like, you, you need, we, we all need to repent of that. I, more than anyone else, I think, um, and I'm not saying this in the stereotypical orthodox pissing contest of, no, I'm the worst sinner. No, no, I'm the worst sinner. Like, on occasion when I have the will that God has granted me to sit there and examine myself, it produces nothing but horror and sadness. And what that indicates is that I don't judge myself when I should. Yeah. I don't know. What, what, what do you have, Ian? I've kind of ranted and no, raved I, like a lunatic for a little bit. No, I think that's a good point. And I think one of the things I've realized is um, after coming into the church, I immediately, um, you know, not immediately, but fairly quickly started a page. And I did all these things that a lot of people condemned me for. Um, but you had a page before I met you. No, I didn't have an Orthodox page. I thought you did. You had an Instagram, didn't you? No, I started that after I started catechism classes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but no, yeah. So even and even then, like some people condemned me, but, I, you know, I was very upfront with my now spiritual father of what I'm doing is, is sharing my journey. Originally, I had the page just to kind of share my journey, which is still what I'm doing, but right. more from an artistic perspective. And now I'm trying to share the lives of the saints and et cetera, et cetera. But I think something that really stuck with me was how much hate I had thrown at me from people who had been Orthodox six months to people who had been Orthodox six years. And there's something that I've learned from that is that I will never, and I, I mean this, I mean this, and this is not me trying to sound um, like pious or anything, but 
I just, it really messed me up for a while and almost made me leave the faith because I felt just so betrayed by these people who claim to be Christians. And it's just, it made, it's made me think that I'm, I'm not going to do that to people. And I, I see people who start a page that aren't, aren't cath aren't Christian or aren't uh, catechumens or whatever. And to me, it's like, it's not up to us to judge somebody by what they're doing. Maybe they shouldn't be doing it, but that's, that's not up to not, not up to you. It's just something I was thinking when you were saying that, like, people really seem to have something out for me when I first started this page. And in my mind, it, maybe I was doing something wrong, but in my mind, it made me feel like I'm obviously doing something, something right at some point to get, to get this type of backlash, you know? Well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But I, I do think you touch on an interesting point here. And that's one of the things that I think, you know, if, if you don't follow Isaac Tahiri over on um, Traditionalist Project, yeah, the Traditionalist Project, shout you should out, shout out just Isaac. for the sake, yeah, just just for the sake of his beauty posting on Fridays, which he usually starts mid afternoon on Thursday because, well, you know, he's bad at counting time and he <laughs> likes doing beauty project stuff, which is awesome. But occasionally he'll do short essay kind of things. And I say essay, but what I mean is like 75 or 100 word post posts, stories. Yeah. And in, in his, is that what they're called? Instagram stories? Yeah. So, so he'll, he'll do that and he'll reflect on various things. And the one that he did today was talking about the evils and the danger of social media. And it's, more or less reflects something that I've thought for a number of years as well. And that is that social media allows you to have the theoretical veneer of community, but to engage in gossip and backstabbing and yeah, that disagreeable you, that behavior. you probably wouldn't in real life. Yeah. That you probably more than likely you wouldn't yeah. do it in real life. I mean, I say real life, you wouldn't do it in person. Exactly. Um, well, no, you're right. Real life. Cause social media is not, well, it, it depends on what we mean by that. Yeah. But, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's really easy when you have an, when you have a thought and you are engaging with stuff on social media all the time to go, I think X, Y, or Z thing. And just start. And you start type, posting yeah. stuff. I do it and, all the time. And I say this for myself because I'm thinking back to when I had my own Instagram page and didn't have various things attached to it other than myself. Yeah. And, and now you do. So you have to be a little bit more. So now I'm very careful about yeah. what I say and do because... Well, if I screw this up, that falls back on you. <laughs> well, and I'm getting better at it. I've been, you know. But but, but either way, this ability to project your thoughts to the world in 15 seconds, you know, or what's Twitter's thing, like 380 characters, 320 yeah. characters, whatever it is. The fact that that is available is something that, we, that should frighten us because it is, it allows us to be thoughtless in a way that you couldn't be 50 years ago. Yeah. I mean, People have said stuff to me, and I have said stuff to people on the internet that if I did it in real life, as Ian has said, we would have engaged in fisticuffs. Yeah. And some of these people I probably would have lost to. <laughs> you know? Same. It's I always think about that when people message me things, because cause like my background, I'm like, you definitely wouldn't say that to me. But that's like not the way to think. It's more so just like I'm guilty of it too. Right. And it doesn't social media doesn't give you a chance to think. Like well, you don't, you don't, you should take a deep breath, maybe type out what you're typing, read it and be like, oh, I sound like an idiot right now. Well, I probably shouldn't press send. I, I think I've told you that a couple of months ago I was like, I usually don't comment on anything on social media. Very rarely do I comment. But a couple of months ago, there was some discussion around the uh, Rings of Power trailer um, that has come out from Amazon. And somebody in one of the groups I'm in, which has a lot of Orthodox people in it, posted some comment that was very poorly worded but i knew what he meant and i thought it was obvious what he meant to other people what he meant so i posted an agreement with him and other people were like well wait a minute what about this and i fell into that hole of making a bunch of comments which i shouldn't have done like i shouldn't have posted anything initially but i kept on posting comments and it turned into me getting into a verbal altercation with an orthodox priest <laughs> which wasn't good and like honestly i've thought back on what was said back and forth and towards the end of it charity kind of regained the upper hand glory to god but i wasn't nice to him and he didn't say anything that was disagreeable you know he was just saying hey look you know quit being such a slave to your passions and i was like no but i like my passions 
And in retrospect, like at, within a couple of days, I was like, my goodness, why did I do that? Yeah. It's usually That's what social media does to you. Yeah. So just uh, be aware of that before you send hate mail to us, please. Well, if you send hate mail, go for it. I don't read it. I will. Because. Because <laughs> I have a problem doing that. Because I don't. I mean, if, if, if you hate, if you don't like what we're doing, yeah. that's fine. I'd, I'm more than willing to hear disagreement. But if you're talking trash and just trolling, I don't care about your opinion. Yeah. I mean, I've. We're, we, have, well, we, we always say, you know, leave a comment. Tell us your, your questions or comments or concerns. Concerns are different than you telling us we shouldn't be doing something. Well, it's not even a matter of we shouldn't be doing something. There was the comment that you received a while back um, when you'd taken a picture of our priest. And our priest doesn't always have a beard. Sometimes he shaves his beard. And yeah. somebody posted um, anathema with regard to the priest. And it's like, dude, he's, been he's a, a canonical priest. There is no canon that says you have to grow a beard to be a priest. And if there is... Um Please send it our way because there I haven't seen it and I asked and nobody could provide one. So yeah, well I've I've read most of the apostolic canon, <clears throat> albeit that's been a number of years ago, several head injuries back, and I've slept a few times since then. So my memory of them is not as good as it ought to be. But the fact that but some... I don't ever recall seeing that canon. I do recall seeing canon saying if you're a monk and you come into a city, you have to cut your hair short and trim your beard short because you can't cut, go around acting like a spiritual father if you're not. Yeah. But that's the only one regarding beards. And also, beards monastics do not cut their beards. Right. That's a monastic thing. Though. Exactly. But when someone said that, I was like, well, it just really shows how toxic social media is that someone, in they saw a picture of a priest without a beard and immediately said anathema. And it's like, he is one of, I mean, I haven't had many he's a, priests. He's a good priest. He's a really he's good priest. one of the best priests I've had. And um, it took me a while to realize that. And it upsets me even more now um, that me and me and... Our, our priests have gotten closer and, you know, he still gives me a hard time, but I need it. And it well, just, yeah. yeah, I need it. I mean, like he, I he, said. Gives, he gives Garrett a hard time. Yeah. Like, he gives, oh, you're finally growing your beard on how, how long are you going to grow? Yeah. <laughs> and Garrett's got a huge beard. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, it Garrett just looks very monastic in many ways. It just shows that it's so easy for us to say something on social media and not realize, you know, what it may be doing or, or realizing that it's better to look within yourself and realize kind of how screwed up you are, you know, before you go, go bashing other right. people. So, so with that, with that being said, I just want people to, um, to know that if you're starting a journey or starting a page or, or doing something and you have uh, a good intention behind it and you have the blessing of your spiritual father, I support it. And, um, if you ever need someone to talk Hit to us your, up and we'll help you out. Yeah. Because it, it really screwed me up for a while. You know, there was people sending pictures to, to, priests and monks of, of me and my wife and bashing us. And it was uh, pretty hurtful for, for quite a while there. And then I just realized my spiritual father said, just ignore it. There's going to be those type of people, whether you're Christian or Buddhist or, you know, all right. walks of life have people that are going to do things and you've done those same things too. So. Right. Well, and, and, exactly. And Remember we, that. Lest we forget. Um, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll share some of my, my sense for a moment, although in a very obtuse fashion. You recall a particular friend of ours who one night we were having, you know, we, were, we went out and had a beer and I said some extremely unkind things Yeah, for the sake of saying unkind things. And all of us involved in that conversation were orthodox. And it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, we are sinners. I am a sinner. I say and do sinful things on a fairly regular basis. I don't want to most of the time i try not to but i fall so this is also not a blanket condemnation of oh if you've said a mean thing online screw you because no certainly not you know you if you sinned go confess yeah do do the penances your priest gives you um they're for the healing of your soul and your body right the and, and i say the same for myself but like with social media, with the internet, be careful before you say something. There's a reason why the Road to Paradise Instagram page doesn't have a lot of posts. It's because I'm very reticent to say yeah. things. Um, and I'm pretty focused on the Orthodox Logos page right, right now because it's, glory to God, it it's is blowing up. It is blowing up, and it's really beautiful to see. Um, something I've always wanted with with my skills and my art is to like 
get some sort of message across. And the messages I was getting across previous to orthodoxy right. were not good ones. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really happy that it's like a way that I can truly glorify God. And I wake up every day excited about learning more and doing more. So I'm, I'm feeling very blessed. So everybody that supports, thank you. it means a lot. It really does. Um, yeah. We have a good feeling about the publishing company and it's going to take some time, but you know, our goal is to be able to do this for yeah. If, if full we time. Could, if, if all I had to do was read you guys' manuscripts and edit them and help you guys with them, if that's all, if that was all I had to do, if I didn't have to do other work, that would be awesome. Yeah, and podcasts and videos and my main my goal is. Can can, can we pause for a moment to real to, to just harken back to you know six ish seven months ago, and recognize that the only reason this is a thing is because you bullied me into this. Yeah, I did. Like all of the things that I'm doing with you are you and I sit happened because you and I were sitting there talking. And I was like, oh yeah, have you th- heard of or considered these kinds of things? And you going, no, that's awesome. So next week, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean next week? I was just speaking in hypotheticals, and you're like, well, not anymore. It's a reality. Yeah, that's crap. That's the thing is like that kind of goes back to what I was saying about people bashing me. That's just how I am. Right. Like I find something, I'm 110 percent in. No matter what it is, I've always been that way my entire life. But this is something that I can be a hundred percent, a hundred and ten percent in, and like, I know it's not. I know it's not something I'm gonna let go of. This is like gonna be a lifelong thing, Lord willing. So, yeah, it's just it's just how I am. So people that may have a certain perception of me, they just don't know. Um, like Nathan knows, or my wife knows. It's like if something is gonna be done, if someone brings something up, and I find it interesting. You're I'm going to I'm I mean, spend all my money the on it. Your wife makes jewelry, right? It's because you yeah. bullied her into doing it. Pretty much. Because she, she, she said that would be yeah. cool. And you said, okay, well, here's all the stuff. Go do it. Yeah. I was like, what do you need? How can we get it? I'll help you, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, not to take credit for it, but I'm just the type of person, like if, like I'm saying to you guys, if, if, if you, you're dumb enough to open your mouth in front of Ian, be very careful what comes out because he I'll, will take it very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> if, and if you don't do it, I'll do it. And then, or he'll make you do it. Yeah. So, which is why I'm sitting here wondering why on earth I had to watch the She Hulk trailer. Yeah. I'm glad we didn't do that again. I mean, we'd still do have time, but we, I'd, I'd really rather not. That right. was a very unpleasant experience. We'll do a Patreon only She Hulk oh, uh, reaction. But yeah, with all these rants being done, and I think it was good, some good stuff to get off our chest. And there's been a lot of stuff online that have been, has been pretty disturbing to me. And it, I just want to remind people that. Um, reconciliation and forgiveness are at the heart of orthodoxy. And if if we can't forgive ourselves and forgive each other, um, there's there's not there's not much we, we we shouldn't be online at all if if we can't if we can't just you know realize that we all make mistakes and we're all sinners and that we're all part of the body of Christ, the body of the church. And it's 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 really important just to forgive each other. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm asking for your forgiveness. Uh, right now, I hope that you forgive me, and I forgive you guys as well. And may the Lord have mercy on us, because we all fall short every single day of of being, you know, of being worthy of being Christians, of being Orthodox Christians. So, well, it's not forgiveness Sunday, so I'll say that uh, my role here is to be a curmudgeon. What are you gonna say? <laughs> if I have offended anyone, please forgive me. Um, if anyone has said anything that they're worried offended me, which I highly doubt is the case because I don't know what anyone has said with regards to this. If you feel that way, God forgives and I forgive, or I forgive yeah. and God forgives. Amen. So so with that being said, um, we hope to see you guys soon. Make sure to like, subscribe, become a Patreon member. Send us your manuscripts. We'll yeah. have our prices up soon. Yeah, we'll probably work on that for a bit after this, and um, we will see you very soon. God bless. May the Lord guide and protect you. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. See ya. Cheers.